Well, uh, Phil, thank you so much for agreeing to do this. Oh, sure. Very exciting. Thanks for taking the time out. Um, you have a, you know, like most of our speakers, uh, I just did a thing with uh, an interview with uh, Gabor uh, Mate. Okay. Yeah, and and you're, it's interesting because your your um, background is also um, kind of circular or multifaceted in that you know you re wrote the ketamine papers. Um, you're an expert on ketamine. You do ketamine assisted psychotherapy. You've done MDA work. Uh, plus, you wrote articles on Buddhism and psychedelics, spirituality, progressive politics, violence, uh, and then you're a gardener. You're a furniture maker. Uh, you're an hey, artist hey, and woodworker. Hey, out the early morning flattery. I need to go through the day here. I, I know I'm going to be broke down by patients. Relax. That's right. That's right. Well, yeah. maybe not. Who knows? But uh, you're kind of a, a, a Renaissance man, as Monet in the background, to, you know. Uh, so with all of that, how does that integrate in terms of ketamine treatment? Um, the Buddhist background, the connection, um, well, there's a you know a broken evolution that really started. It really started way back with uh, Louis Levin, in uh, in the turn of the millennia of the 20th century, who uh, began to really write using um, a mescaline, which uh, Hefter. That's where the Hefter name comes from for the foundation, which I was a founder of. The Hefter, uh, Arthur Hefter, synthesized mescaline. He took it out of, uh, uh, I think it was uh, uh, peyote, and uh, it became fairly much of a rage in Europe. And people began, to, uh, we know that Picasso tried it, for example. Mm. And uh, there's a long history of, of not just psychedelic use, but beginning to see psychedelic use as transformative. <laughs> it goes way back, and that's where we continued uh, with, you know, uh, uh, Paul Graf and the Maryland Psychiatric Group. And um, I got into it in 83 with Sasha Shogun through uh, the Secret Chief, uh, who was, uh, 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 there's a wonderful book by Ma Myron Stoller uh, around about Leo Zeff. So Sasha, I was in the early research group with Sasha. I'm sorry, the late part of the research group. So Sasha Shogun would make chemicals uh, and then taste them up and they would be analogs of things we knew. For instance, MDMA was synthesized and, and uh, patented uh, by Bayer in uh, 1912 or 1914, this wow, I didn't know. opinion. And so when Sasha was looking at the phenethylamine moiety, well, much like there is a, uh, a, a uh, tryptamine moiety, the central moiety chemical constitution is phenethylamine, he began to run all kinds of uh, uh, analog uh, experiments and he developed 2CB, MDA came out of him. MDMA was rediscovered as part of this workup. It had never been really uh, tasted as far as we know that one guy thinks he has found notes that say it was tasted. It was, it was bulked in uh, with a weight reduction thing around meth meth methamphetamine because that's what the Germans were using and that's what led to uh, the Nazi blitzkrieg being so effective was the use of uh, stimulants and cocaine, uh, but particularly methamphetamine for the great warriors who just never slept and burnt out but swept through Europe while everyone else was sleeping. So anyway, he took the... Uh, that and he began to fashion things and uh, in uh, the late 70s he tasted and came across MDMA and knew it had great potential and I think it still is the best of the of those chemicals in terms of its effectiveness as a uh, uh, a heart opener uh, in, in its general aspect so I came into that in 83 when it was legal and so there's this long history of we were bu building uh, psychotherapy at that point around uh, MDMA in particular, but around mushrooms, around various things that we had. Some things hadn't been introduced yet, like 5-MeO DMT. I was in the first group that did that, uh, that we know of, which was uh, in 1985 at Esselt. So um, 
what my interest was always, Richard, is as, as a uh, therapist. I've always been a therapist since I was in med school at Bellevue. And um, uh, I felt the revolutionary promise of the MDMA experience because it changed the whole nature of relationships within the therapeutic structure. And I became a real advocate of one of the early people in that and writing about it. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a 60s guy, so I'm always looking for revolution, wherever it could happen in terms of the quality of life, you know, of sharing and, and connection and, and loving kindness. So, uh, so that, that became a, a, a really uh, central part of my life. Then it got suppressed. And um, I had a ketamine experience in 1990. Ketamine was legal, uh, as it still is, or worldwide, basically. Uh, and um, I could see from that one experience, I didn't do it for 10 years after that, because uh, they had overdosed me a bit. Nobody checked my sensitivity like we do nowadays. And I was sick for two or three days after. But what I came in contact with was the formlessness realms, the realms of pure energy. Um, I had lost a child by that point, and certainly I was interested in that. Uh, he had died just uh, a year and a half before that experience, so I was in both great grief and personal uh, uh, difficulty in our marriage. <laughs> he had been sick for four years. He was near 17. So there was a, a hell of a lot going on. So I did that one experience, and I could really envision myself coming out of it in the integration Watching it, I can still see that first experience well uh, as a, a an energy format. And you know, if you go back to Castaneda, like the second book, you know, and Castaneda has these nice energy formats that you can imagine the glowing eggs and all of that. And people were working in Reiki and all kinds of energy formats, uh, which I, you know, I tend to be a rationalist uh, and an evidence based scientist kind of guy. Uh, I could see that uh, along with my nascent interest in Tibetan Buddhism, that this was really a way to help people move out of their own way and into ego dissolution. So around 1999, I resumed. And at that point, with a, a group of males, my friends who have still continued and shall remain anonymous, some of whom are well known. And we've been a group for 22 years. So I had voluminous, we started off as a, as an ayahuasca group, and um, we morphed towards ketamine and ketamine in a variety of shapes. And uh, so I began to have a lot of experience with ketamine personally, and I began to use it in small numbers with people who I thought would benefit from it, since it was legal, did it out of this house, actually. And then I decided that this was really a therapeutic venture as an assistant psychotherapy. So I've never seen this as disembodied from the therapy. And at that point, you know, we had the uh, MAPS uh, and, and uh, Hefter and USONA and later the unmentionable com COMPASS groups coming together to uh, study assisted psychotherapy. And I did an MDMA study here also uh, with life-threatening illness on, with MAPS. And, and so there was this sense of how do you build an all, a totally alternative structure that serves the people, uh, but is not just about taking a medicine on its own. Nothing wrong with that. I'm not being negative. But within a therapeutic construct, within people coming from uh, to you for suffering issues and for relationship issues, and the rest, how do you embody that? Which we're still working on. So we're doing training all over. and We're doing a, uh, uh, a training with Dick Schwartz and IFS. We're doing an advanced training uh, for our group. We have an, a national, international group of people who've come out of our over 400 persons training and experiential work with ketamine. We're forming basically a new kind of uh, structure for doing the work with people. In the ketamine world, that means, from our point of view, being orthodox in my, in my way, uh, trying to set a standard of care for it, uh, we're doing three-hour sessions. Uh, so the ketamine experience roughly is about an hour with recovery. We do session before. We do a full exploration of human beings 
before and after and integrating the experience of ketamine, which primarily is a, an experience of getting out of your own way and traveling journey free uh, in that realm. So that's been the love of my life. We've been having a great time with it. I, at the end of my uh, career, I'm 78. Uh, you know, it's been a, a fabulous and growingly fabulous experience, both at the clinical level and at the level of, uh, you know, exploring this and making it grow. And because ketamine is legal, we're outside the strictures of FDA work. So we, our, our methodologies are broad. Uh, we're, I've started a commercial organization to benefit people through certain uses of ketamine, which we're going to be developing because uh, it has unexplored benefits. So uh, I, I would say that's the, the essence of it. Uh, a a uh, psychotherapy that is growing in our understanding of how to use it. It, it had been squelched by Nixon, etc. And um, it's brilliant stuff. It doesn't work for everybody, but it's, it's a change. If you think, what is the revolution? The revolution is from, you know, negativity and suppression to opening and uh, enlivening and connecting uh, and putting your own ego into clear visual and emotional focus so you can see how ego gets in your way. Uh, so, you know, it's all essence work. It combines well with whatever form of Buddhism, you know, with, if you're not too wrapped up in getting reborn again. So, you know, all of that sort of stuff. And, you know, lately we've been working uh, at Menla Retreat Center in, uh, in the Catskills, and Bob Thurman uh, has become a very close buddy and friend. And so we're in the brilliance of his mind and... Uh, you know, it's a bit of a different strike than my secular Buddhism, but he's remarkable. So there's an embrace. We're doing dieta with it. We just did a program on how you put a uh, ritual diet, uh, which is called dieta within the ayahuasca preparation into it. How do we make this a, uh, an unfolding, sacred, differentiated kind of experience for human beings so that they grow and that their suffering diminishes? And it's not always successful, but it's overwhelmingly successful. It's not one time, it's hard work. And, you know, we, it's not standalone. We use a general psychiatric approach to people as well. Uh, so that's that's basically the story of it. Wow, very, very exciting. I, I, that, that's what uh, this conference is about, March 10th to the 12th, uh, learning from psychedelic assisted psychotherapy and psychedelics. And um, I know Dick Schwartz is coming early. I hope you're able to come early. But it, it really is a revolution. And it attracts people our age and younger, of course, but especially those of us who've been through the revolution, the Vietnam War, uh, that 60s, 70s time period. Um, so it's a, kind of a second coming of uh, kind of a, a psychedelic sangha that uh, is well, uh, you're quite on the mark. I mean, it's vast. The expansion of, of psychedelic use without the uh, therapeutics. I mean, it's uh, just, it's an exploding realm. Uh, and, you know, we're looking at diversity and how, how do we overcome obstacles in terms of uh, people, white, non-white people, people of color and what their views are of this. And we're trying to broaden it as much as, we can, but it is, it's a whole change in the kind of uh, uh, vector and, and the, uh, uh, what's, what's the word, from negative to positive. It's about pleasure and thoughtfulness and interest. And so it's not suppressive, which so much of psychotherapy has been, not all of it. I've been a systems person and a, you know, a Mnuchin guy and all of that stuff, which was not suppressive, which was opening opening to the family, opening to culture, and we're opening to culture. So the other suppressive part of the psychotherapeutic history has been its lack of interest uh, in trauma, its lack of interest in sexism, its lack of interest in repression in general. And, and this is a, a it's those of us who see it that way are practicing that as part of the integration 
with the psychedelic. So it's not just psychedelic. It's if you're in this realm, look at your prejudices. Let them be open to you. See why. What's my, why do I have this prejudice? Do I need it? You know, and, and that's prejudice within the family structure or prejudice in general or sense of, or what, what is my holding on to my sense of injustice? I was really badly treated and I am still stuck in the view of injustice. And the core of it is always about trust, right? So where it's not endogenous and not seemingly coming from a human being because of their neurological structure, it seems, it seems to be a lot about trust or mostly about trust. So that's what this is about also. <laughs> Building trust is a very positive thing. You know, you know as you're saying this, uh, I'm thinking we, we probably, uh, a category would be uh, impaired trust disorder. That, well, what that, that is, is the attachment disorder, which is pretty much that, but not deep enough because it doesn't, the lack of trust goes into the 50, 60% of so-called normal attachment. But, that, that's yeah. what's so exciting about this is that um, the psychedelics um, and psychedelic therapy and experiences on your own or with groups, uh, the, the sense of um, connection that evolves. And I was talking with Gabor and he said, uh, I think he said something like, connection is a life reality. Yeah. that we can turn towards the pessimism and the negativism and cut people out in our lives and be alone and miserable uh, and but relatively safe from personal injury and interpersonal relationships. And I see psychedelics as, you know, it means mind, mind manifesting, mind expanding. Um, so the ability to unblock that um, negative desire to push people away and isolate and you know some of the reasons people have severe depression as well and the impact of trauma on relationships so that's between with depression and trauma addiction all of these things are pushing away realm so we're getting into a, a different buddhist realm of awareness yeah yeah and, and people in the buddhist realm are, are uh coming along into that. Uh, Thurman is coming along. It's very interesting. My teacher, Stephen Batchelor, has written a book on solitude where he's going back and exploring ayahuasca and mushrooms. And he's a very, very, uh, not dour, but self-effacing and, and, and English. He's very English, right? Uh -huh. I sat with him and I, all the time I've sat with him, I did a seven day retreat in the Alps with him. He never once spoke of his psychedelic experiences, but they were extensive as a young man. And, and he's coming back and exploring them again. I'm not sure the extent of his embrace, but the extent of his exploration is there. And he's, he's out, he outed himself. And, um, and you see a lot of that happening. We did an issue and tricycle a long time ago, a few years ago, about uh, the difference between intoxication within the Buddhist framework and, and mind exploration. And uh, Jack and uh, 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 Cornfield and, and Thurman and Batch were, uh, and I forget who else, uh, Larry, Larry uh, uh, Bedina, not Larry Bedina, that's his cousin, um, all came out on this little article I did about, you know, psychedelics used properly and mind expanded, their mind is poor. Uh, to, and, have, to have Robert Thurman and Jack Cornfield and the others that you mentioned, I mean, Thurman is, uh, you know, so big, Columbia professor, big name, uh, big person. He's a miracle. The guy's he, a miracle. And you can't complain that his, his daughter's very effective, too. I mean, uh, <laughs> oh, well, let's not go that way. Everybody loves her, let's right? Go. Let's not exhibit our lust online. <laughs> Uma Thurman, everybody loves uh, the movie she's in and the fact yeah. that her, her, her father is an incredible Buddhist teacher. Well, you know, I, you know he's married to Leary's third wife. And, oh, uh, wow. And uh, they're 80, and they're a wonderful couple. They've been together since Millbrook, and so I've been having experiences with both of them. That's Uma's mother. And she was married to Leary for a year, his third wife. Uh-huh. And she has some great stories about that. 
Oh, so we've got all this history, all of these rich stories, and then we have the the, the growth in the psychotherapy field. It, it's it's an awakening in so many different ways, and it can. Well, let's just talk about us for two minutes, and then I should go. Okay. Do you want to have this kind of conversation? I don't know. We uh, it's fun. I don't know. What do you think? I'm okay with it. I don't. I don't want to miss what you want. I'm okay. I'm I'm from that revolution. So why not talk about the people that are involved in this uh, healing revolution uh, without going overboard uh, and giving it to everybody, which is ridiculous, and not going back to the Leary days as well. Uh, Leary days is still here. It's still here. The Leary days. It's just you don't have Leary. You just have everyone under the sun music. Yeah. What do you think about that? I mean, uh, I mean, it's prolific now. So, whether it's no saying, I, I, I think still we have to come up with legalization in, in all realms and get the money out. So until we get the money out, we have many, many reasons for addiction. There will always be addiction. People will be attracted to a substance, but the money imperils whole nations. It's ruining, it's ruining, uh, you know, uh, parts of Latin America. It's ruining uh, so many of our people. Um, so, uh, you know, there are favorable drugs and all drugs are abusable. Um, so I think we have to approach it differently. Uh, we do have to legalize. The war on drugs made everything pop open into the worst way and made people underground to go to jail or, or the rest. So if we legalize and provide support, education, and, uh, you know, the problems of of uh, adulterated products and new things on the dark web coming in with no real vetting and people getting harmed by that. All that's money driven. And I think if we get the money out of politics and if we get the money out of drugs, uh, we, we would achieve a huge breakthrough. How easy that is? Well, we could see it's not easy. Money in politics is extremely hard and mirrors money in drugs. Yeah. Well, I, I want to thank you for your time and your honesty. Well, this is okay. Yes, this is great. Okay. And that's what we want to see uh, at the conference as well, not just the information, but the heart and the connection as well.